Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 22nd, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. My pleasure to be joined once again by State Representative Denise Provo with this week's legislative update. Representative Provo, Denise Provo, how are you? I am fine, thank you for asking, sir, and yourself. I'm doing very well. Um, we joked about not seeing each other in so many hours. Um, but before we start in with the show, Denise, um, last night for many people who were tuned in, they saw the annual awards and honors program for the Somerville Media Center. And it, was, it gave us so much pleasure in giving you the award for excellence in public service. Um, thank you so much for the kind words that you said about it, but you know, it was, it was something that we wanted to do back in the spring. Um, we got postponed because of COVID, but the staff and I and the board were determined that we were gonna make that happen. So congratulations. Well, I was touched. Thank you very much. And, and if anybody wants to see a retrospective of Denise Provo's haircuts through the years, um, by all means, go to the Somerville Media Center website and check out the video. Um, Denise, it, it was you know our pleasure to do that because you have been an absolute terrific supporter of the Media Center all through your elected years as alderman and now a state rep. So. You know, we are truly grateful for everything that you've done for us. Hey, you put the First Amendment into action. <laughs> we can't do it alone, though. We have, we have cheerleaders all along the way. You and Senator Jalen and Mayor Curtis Tony, you've always been our biggest supporters. So thank you again. Legislative update, I just want to go over a couple of things on the COVID front. Um, the city of Somerville slipped into the red zone last week. Um, which means our infection rates are starting to climb. Um, luckily for us, our fatalities are fairly low compared to other like-sized municipalities, and those have not increased over the last two to three weeks. Um, but we do see our infection rates going up. Um, hospitalizations, we're waiting for that data that will probably come out later today or early tomorrow. So unfortunately, the virus knows no city boundaries. And, um, you know, municipalities like Everett and Chelsea and Methuen and Lawrence and Lowell and Brockton are getting really hard hit. Um, and it was a matter of time. I think a lot of us, it was just a matter of time before our rates would start to go up again. So it's an unfortunate update that I have to give, but um, those are the times we're living in. You know, this thing is not going to be beaten easily without cooperation from a lot of people. Denise, we have um, anything before we get into a couple of deep subjects that I want to give you most of the airtime on today. Any legislative updates that we need to know about on Beacon Hill? Well, the House is working on putting together its budget which normally we would do in the spring. We've delayed it really as long as we can. And um, the governor, as you know, week before last, or last week, produced his budget, um, which called for, for more revenue even than his original budget at the beginning of the year. Um, and yet at the same time, he says he will veto any new taxes, also called revenues. So um, he's, he's put himself in the position of saying no to austerity and no to taxes. So, um, so the House is trying to adjust. So no to austerity no to new taxes, yet Magic Charlie found a bunch of money to spend. Can you, can you help me to understand that? Are we talking about the money that he's spending um, for, uh, for his new plan to, um, to reduce the impact of evictions now that the moratorium is ended? 
Well, I'm not quite sure. I'm taking it from a very wide range overview. If okay. you're not looking to increase revenue by no new taxes, and he's not looking to make any severe cuts from an austerity standpoint, how is he going to fund all of these new programs that he's increasing his budget by? Well, I think a, a certain amount of the funding for this budget, given that we have a revenue shortfall estimated in the realm of three to five billion dollars for this fiscal year, which started July 1st, um, a chunk of that is going to have to come from our so-called rainy day fund, our reserves. Um, but we know that next year is going to be a tough year too, so we can't deplete all of our reserves. And if we deplete too much of our reserves, our bond ratings likely to be lowered and then our borrowing costs are going to go up. Right, how much money have we got in the rainy day? We've got over 3 billion. So he could, he could potentially fund all of his new programs by draining the rainy day. Right, but we can't, we can't in good conscience do that. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the reason for delaying the budget as long as we did was the hope that there would be um, a successor to the CARES Act over the summer, that there would be more revenue for state and local government, which evidently could still happen. It's been stop and go, but maybe it's a little more go now. Um, and it appears that the governor hasn't spent all of the CARES Act money. You know, that I was kind of surprised by his announcement of the 171 million that he was making available for, for housing. Um, but it turns out that all of that's none of that is new money. Some of it is money that the legislature had already appropriated and he hadn't spent. And the rest of it is CARES Act money that he hasn't spent. So, Denise, Denise, are you actually saying that Governor Charlie Baker has been squirreling away some money to make himself look good? So it would appear because, <laughs> you know, if he were serious, I think, about um, saving people from eviction, he wouldn't have brought the money out on the eve of the moratorium expiring. He would have been using it through the summer to help people negotiate with their landlords or, you know, uh, make, make different housing arrangements when infection rates were lower. And we knew that, we knew that the, the moratorium was going to end in the fall, probably when we were going to have another surge. So it seems to me that that if the money had been and and the program to um, for you know his his ideas that that most of the money is going to go for mediation between landlords and tenants that that if that money had been rolled out earlier, people would be in much more secure housing situations. So let's stay with the budget a little bit. I mean, you and I have both done budgets over the years. We understand that you can move things around from one line yeah. item to another line item. But at the end of the day, you've got to have a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. How likely is it that Massachusetts will have a balanced budget? Well, we have to. It is a, it's a requirement of law that we balance our budget. The, the tricky thing is going to be how we balance it. Um, especially if, if indeed there is no additional federal assistance between now and the end of this year. I think the House will probably act on a budget before the end of November. Um, but, you know, it's either going to have to be, it, it's clear that it's going to have to be a good chunk from out of reserves. Um, and then it's 
going to be a trade-off between cuts and revenues. And if the governor says he's going to veto any revenues, then any revenues that the legislature adds are going to have to have veto-proof majorities in the House and the Senate. And that's always tricky. And with that, good luck on this budget. I know the municipalities are struggling with their own budgets. So mm -hmm. I'll say it again, I say it a lot on these shows, it, it shows the severe lack of leadership at the federal level. Not quite grasping that when you talk about people's lives, um, you, you're talking about it in the abstract at the federal level. I don't think they understand what people are going through. You know, they've got to come up with these relief packages for the states. The states have to come up with the relief packages for the municipalities. Um, quite frankly, you know, I would prefer that they start pumping money back into people's pockets directly. So let's go into the personal side of this thing. Yeah. Governor Baker also decided to lift the moratorium, the eviction ban. And there was a moratorium that was placed way back in the summer. I think. And then he had a deadline of this past Saturday. He mm -hmm. said, we'll keep it in place until November 17th. 17th. And people were pleading to, with him to extend that moratorium. Mm -hmm. It is now lifted. Yep. There are certain municipalities across Massachusetts who have their own ban, Somerville being one of them. Mm -hmm. But Denise, from a statewide level, let's take it. So effectively, what Governor Baker said was, okay, I'm lifting the ban. Now the renters are on their own and the landlords are on their own and the banks are on their own, the people who hold the mortgages. Mm -hmm. Do you want to try to explain what is the next step? I mean, it's very complex, but you take it away. Well, landlords who want to evict tenants have to, in Massachusetts, you have to go to court to evict a tenant. Um, interestingly, in Massachusetts, lenders do not have to go to court to foreclose on um, property owners who have fallen into arrears on their mortgages. Um, and, you know, that's, that's another potential danger too. It was a big problem after the so-called Great Recession of 2008, 2009, which was not as bad as this one. Um, so, you know, there, the, the cash flow problems, um, you know, are, are up and down the line. Um, but if you're a tenant, um, your landlord does have to go to court. And, you know, one thing you, you didn't mention that's, that's hanging out there is the, um, the Center for Disease Control also, um, by executive order, created an eviction moratorium. But the legal opinion is that it doesn't prevent the legal process of eviction from going forward. All it prevents potentially is what's called execution, is where the, the sheriff comes and takes you and your stuff out of the property. Um, and there are places in the country where that has happened despite the, the federal moratorium. So nobody's quite sure. Um, what that one actually means in practice. But as you said, some localities like Somerville have an eviction moratorium. And presumably that would prevent someone from being put out of their home or apartment, but wouldn't prevent the legal process from going forward. And it certainly doesn't abate the back rent that's owed. Right. So let me let me see if I so if it, we have a heartless or unscrupulous or really in dire straits landlord because of their own financial condition, mm -hmm. 
they could begin the eviction process. Oh, absolutely. Even though Somerville has an eviction prohibition, they could begin the court process, but we could not, under Somerville's emergency ban, they could not be physically taken out of their property. Well, presumably, although I don't know that the validity of the local ordinance has been litigated, um, and I, I cannot say authoritatively what would happen if, um, if a landlord made a claim that the ordinance was unlawful, right. um, you know, in excess of municipal powers. Um, at you know in a in an action for say to to force the the execution of an eviction. But if um, they tried to do that, Denise, if you know a group of property owners or an association of property owners tried to challenge Somerville's legality of their yeah. eviction ban, wouldn't the courts say, all right, we'll hear your case, but we're going to put a stay on those evictions until we're done with this? Well, they might. I mean, assuming they're represented by legal counsel and the counsel asks for injunctive relief, um, that could happen. You know, anybody, anybody who's... Um, concerned about an eviction should probably call the city's office of housing stability um, they can also try calling legal services directly if they think that they will qualify but you know a lot of legal services funding in massachusetts comes out of the state budget and only about half of people who qualify for legal services are able to get legal help. Well, you've been, you've been involved in politics in this city long enough that you understand who those legal advocates are. And I happened to jump on a call earlier this week. Today is Thursday. It was earlier this week. And Alan Schachter, who is heads up our division here under the city administration, um, Ellen, you know, understanding the crunch that they are under, the number of applications that they're getting in and the number of requests that they are getting for assistance, mm -hmm. um, Ellen just keeps, you know, making sure people know there is help out there. You need to call these legal assistance lines. You need to call the city of Somerville. Um, that's what they're set up for. So if there are unscrupulous or really at the end of their rope landlords who are trying to boot you out of your home during a pandemic, um, reach out for help, just don't take it. There's a number of things that those, those landlords have to do. They have to take you into court. They have to get the courts to understand um, what they're doing. And the other thing I wanted to ask you, you know, the court system was down at uh, down capacity too. Mm -hmm. But I did notice that he's now allowed the courts to be opened back up for these evictions. The, the housing courts are certainly reopened, but you know, even the, the courts have been, have held hearings by Zoom, some of them, even through the pandemic. Um, and I think it's going to, to vary a lot by, by jurisdiction, how the courts are operating. Some that have been open have had to close down again for COVID cases. Um, you know, Somerville doesn't have a housing court. It's the Somerville District Court that hears those cases. And I, I don't know to what extent they're, they're open or if they, they're hearing cases remotely. Um, and I did not find out. I did not think to find out before this show. No, 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 no. I mean, this is a conversation, you know, to mainly impart information about where to get help, I guess, mm -hmm. is, is what we're talking about. 
Um, Rep Conley, I heard him last week on some radio show. Rep Conley, shame on you not coming back on this one and going on Jim and Marjorie. If you think I'm not keeping a tally on that, I am. Um, but Rep Conley was talking about, you know, the legislators, the legislators' initiatives of what you're trying to do behind the scenes. But unfortunately, you know, a legislative body, it takes time for that to weave its, through, weave its way through committee. Do we have any update on that piece of it on the House side? Uh, well, there, there is no sign of the House taking action on, or the Senate either, on the bill that Rep Connolly and Senator Jalen fa uh, filed to extend the moratorium. But the next time they're on, you have to get, get it from, uh, from the more direct source. Well, I mean, they would, would, would they be required to file a new bill since the governor's moratorium has been lifted? Oh, they filed it already. Already? They okay. filed it in advance. They filed it in advance of the expiration. Got it. Got it. Well, it's going to be a mess. And the way that I look at it is that this is the worst of the worst, is to try to put people out of their homes during a pandemic at the beginning of winter. It just, cruel is the word that comes to mind. Well, yes, and the shelters are all at capacity is, you know, is the other part of that. Because, you know, if you suddenly become homeless and you're not, you know, you are in arrears. Um, and, you know, being evicted is, when you know when it comes to trying to rent an apartment having been evic evicted um you know is a is a mark against you just the way um a bad credit rating would be so if you've been evicted if you were in arrears in your rent before you're probably not going to get shelter um except through the what's called the shelter system which is an, a network of public and private shelters, which from what I understand are all full. And it leads to, you know, it leads to another question. I mean, we're talking about people's homes. The other question is on the business side. What do these small businesses do that took out huge loans for restaurant equipment or for manufacturing equipment? Now they've had to lay off people. Their manufacturing and their output is down. Um, they may file for bankruptcy. There goes their credit rating. Uh, potentially, yes. Although, you know, you were saying earlier on that a, a new federal uh, package would put money in people's pockets. I would say, you know, it needs to go to small businesses as well as to individuals because small businesses are, are hurting tremendously. Yeah, and then we get to the non-business related and the non-personal uh, living related, where you have a whole other thing to worry about, which is personal loans. People may have had personal loans. They went out and they bought a car, a brand new car at the beginning of the year. Now they have no income. They're faced with the fact that they may, they may not go back to peak earning capacity for the next year. They have to sell a car that is now depreciated in value, but they still have a loan. They could be definitely hurt by bad credit. Yes, this this whole catastrophe is is going to have just as it, as it's had dire effects on you know on gross domestic product on the economy as a whole. That's going to to translate into a lot of a lot of deficits, which are are then going to appear as as poor credit or bankruptcy, as you suggest. It is it is not um, a pretty picture of what's going to take place over the next six to nine months. Um, we do have an election coming up. Do we? I think we do. I think we do. In November, um, you are one of the biggest supporters I've ever met in my life about people exercising their right to vote, that it is sacrosanct. If you are given that 
opportunity to vote, please exercise it. Please use it. If things don't look good in your own personal life, I know it's kind of a stretch to say your vote will count, but you and I both know the, the power of the vote. It, yes, as um, I, I was reading, reading an essay this morning uh, on the topic of if, if, if voting wasn't important, why would so many people be trying to stop others from voting? And we see that all over the country, um, especially, you know, as, as different um, jurisdictions try to make voting easier during the pandemic or registering to vote. You know, every step along the way, there's op you see opposition and obstruction. Um, and where that fails, um, you know, crit criticism and, and allegations that, that mail-in voting is fraudulent somehow, which I, I think would not occur to anybody who's actually been in a polling place on election day and seen what the process is like. Well, the vote equals power. Yeah. And those people that are in power want to protect their power. So they will come up with any kind of cockamamie scheme to try to scare you and say, oh, don't vote. It doesn't matter. Or they're going to try to steal your vote. They're going to try to steal what you're doing. It just is insanity when you think about, I mean, especially, I, I want to give a shout out. We probably only have a few seconds left here, Denise, but you know, before, uh, before I sign off for this week, I want to give our elections department, Nick Salerno and his crew in the elections department, huge thanks for the Herculean effort they are doing to make voting easy, convenient, and safe in this city. I've observed with you over the weekend, we observed some of the lines for early voting in front of City Hall. We've seen the drop boxes all over the place. We understand how hard it was to pivot and try to get a new way of voting in this city, but kudos to Nick and his crew. Denise, once again, it is a pleasure, and it was magnificent to see you receive those accolades last night from the Somerville Media Center. Well, um... It's a big transition. I will, I will miss my, um, my official role in many ways, but I'm always, always happy to talk about what's going on in government. And you're not getting off, you're not getting off that easy. You're going to be back on this show before you say hasta mañana. My guest has been State Representative Denise Provo from the 27th Middlesex District. As always, Denise, thank you. Stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time. Thank you.